Uh, so my topic is unsmented total knee. I know it's an uphill battle here in New York and even nationally in the U.S., still about 90 percent cemented. But I think there's evidence that the time has come, and I know we've said this before, but it, this time it's serious. Uh, we tried in the 80s with the PCA, but that was, you know, uh, sintered bead, cobalt chrome. We've come a long way. I do have a conflict. The um, book is incorrect. I am a designer for Stryker, and the implant I'm going to be discussing is one of our newer implants. So the conventional thinking that I'm sure you're going to hear from our next speaker is that um, fixation is really not a big issue in, in knee replacement, that you can get excellent fixation at 10 to 15 years with virtually all uh, implants and techniques. The question is, does the data actually support this? So if you, you look at the Australian registry data, uh, at, after 10 years, particularly among young patients, you, you're seeing significant failure rates up in the 15 percent range. The UK registry shows the same pattern. The, uh, another thing we're seeing in recent years are clusters of failures with tibial debonding. It's a term originally we heard 30 years ago with hips, debonding is a mechanism of failure. But this occurs early with certain implants and with certain cement types and certain techniques. We're really not sure why. Uh, this is a cluster of failures. In our community, we had some local surgeons using a higher viscosity cement. We saw 15 failures within two or three years. Uh, Dennis Nam wrote this up one of the graduates from here at HSS. Um, in response to this, um, with the same implant, um, Adolf Lombardi asked us to look at his when he used the I-beam. The failures we saw were with this keel. So with his high viscosity cement with the I-beam stem, he said he didn't have any failures. Well, that was true, but we did see failures in our area from the same surgeon with the same component. So Dennis got, took an interest in the issue of high viscosity cement. He published two interesting papers. Uh, he looked at AJRR and saw that in the last seven years, uh, the incidence of use of high viscosity cement has gone up. So as new uh, manufacturers have gotten into the cement market, they usually go with a higher viscosity cement. In the same time frame, we've seen early failures. So again, in AJRR, he won the AUKUS award by showing that one of the variables that was associated, maybe not causation, but association of early failures with high vis viscosity cement. Uh, but there seems to be an interplay between the design and the technique. Here's a cluster of failures um, in, among several centers that occurred early, 19 months, uh, very early for a cemented component. It all occurred at the metal cement interface. We don't know the denominator. These are all uh, several referral centers, so maybe it was not that far out of line. But when they looked at the FDA database, they found 200 similar cases. We're talking about d uh, cement failures on the tibial side at one to two years. Um, you're going to have to activate this video because I don't have a mouse up here. Can you click on that? So these are debonding. This is a, uh, Brian Springer has a series of 40 or 50 of these. So people say, well, debonding, how, hard, how much should it be bonded? Well, it should be bonded more than that. Uh, just as uh, on, the, on the scale of bonding of components to cement, you want a little bit more than that. But he has a collection of, uh, he had 10 in his drawer that he took a picture of that he sent me, but they have 40 or 50 of these. So this is, this is a real issue. Um, and what you see is on the tibial side, there's no cement, no fixation. On the femoral side, there's a lot. So this was just presented at AUKUS from Duke, from the Durham VA. So this is the first time we actually have uh, a denominator. And it wasn't a pretty picture. At two to three years, they have 12% uh, revised, 7% pending revision. And again, tibial debonding. But um, only half of these were high viscosity cement. So there's, there's some interplay between technique and design. Uh, years ago, we looked at, at the, when MIS became uh, popular, we saw a lot of early failures in the first two or three years, 45 early failures. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of issues with bone cement. There are too many variables, the type of cement, how you handle it, the type of the component. Um, and most, most surgeons don't mix their own cement. There's an issue of the cost of the cement accessories, uh, the staff concerns, nurses don't like, our, our female nurses that are childbearing age can't mix the cement. And the biggest deal, deal is when the patients get bigger and more active, the cement doesn't get stronger. So just like we switched on the hip, I think that we have equal appeal for the, on the knee. 
it's a, um, we, if we can get equivalent pain relief, uh, which we've studied, and I'll show you our results of that, it's a much faster, simpler technique, fewer variables, it's cost neutral, and it's more versatile, you don't have to use a tourniquet, and there's um, potential for longer term survival. You have to activate this video also. So this is a patient that had a cementless knee six weeks previously. The, pr the reason I'm showing you this, this is the new norm. This is a city official in St. Louis. He's 6'4", 350 pounds, uh, young and active. He's actually lost 50 pounds. He's under 300 for the first time uh, since his total knee. So it would seem that that, that would be a problem for cement. Because as I said, the cement doesn't get stronger when patients get bigger. Well, one of our younger faculty, Matt Abdel, looked this up at the Mayo Clinic. And sure enough, in obese patients, the failure rates are two to three times higher. Well, does cementless do any better? Well, this is um, a comparison of cementless to cemented CRNPS among obese patients. The, the survival was much better. Cementless PS versus cemented PS, survival much better in obese patients. There's an a, a interesting paper from Canada, so it must be true. You have to, you can't argue with this paper, Rich, because it's from, um, uh, never, well, you'll hear, heard of the next guy. This is a, actually a database review of all the RSA data that showed that um, cementless components in the long term are more stable than cemented. So this is the guy that you've heard of. Now I'm going to show you this. Uh, this is uh, Dunbar's yeah. PhD work. You know about this. So this is in the first year. You see cemented. There are a couple of, um, uh, there's one outlier above a, a millimeter of displacement on the tibial side in the first year. The uncemented look, uh, you know, there's, there's more outliers between 0.5 and 1. But in a cementless component like a tapered titanium stem, you don't care if it moves a millimeter in the first year as long as it stops. Well, what happens over time? You see the uncemented do stabilize. They're not moving more. What, what the killer is for cemented components is that at 10 years with RSA under load, you see all these components moving more than a millimeter. And if you are doing a cemented tibia like I did for 20, my first 20 years, that would give me heartburn that a third of my patients are starting to have motion of their cemented tibial component. So this is the, the guy you've heard of, Dunbar's group. Inducible displacement at long term was lower for cementless components suggesting superior fixation. What about the patella? We made some uh, comments about the patella. There's some uh, groundbreaking de uh, data coming out of um, uh, a small hospital here in New York called HSS. Uh, hmm. These are MRIs that are being surreptitiously done on your patients. Of uh, so their cemented patellas, they look terrible. You got uh, a lot of fragmentation, um, uh, impending loosening. Re what you really want is the one on the uh, right where it's an intact patella that's minimally or not asymptomatic. So why do uncemented? Because biologic fixation, just like the hip, it's longer uh, dur durability. It's much more efficient. Uh, it's really growing in popularity. And the technology is much better. These highly porous surfaces that encourage in growth are mechanically stable. So we did an RCT of these and uh, found that the, they were as good or better every way we measured them. We saved about 12 or 13 minutes. The blood loss was exactly the same. Every way you measured these at six weeks, one year, two years, every measurement favored the cementless knees. The cost differential nationally is about $400. Uh, two studies have shown that uh, the time is at least 13 minutes less. And when we looked at the total cost, it's actually less expensive when you consider the cement accessories and, all, and so forth. So my current experience with cementless, I haven't had any failure of ingrowth, one late infection, currently about two thirds of my practice. It's growing rapidly. Uh, 30 years ago, the, the three of us had to cement every stem we did with Dr. Harris, including the Canadian fellow on the right. Uh, it was a long year. Five years later, we weren't cementing any stems, and I think that's what we're going to see on the knee side, uh, just like we did on the hip. The, the attraction is the same, the biology is the same, and I think that the future of total knee over the next decade will be a big switch to cementless. Thank you.